Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. And with me once again, my good friend, Deborah Mero, certified Alexander Technique instructor. Today's topic is the opposite of last podcast. Instead of buying horses, we're going to look at selling horses, which comes up for everybody at some point in their life lots of reasons to sell horses. So we're just going to kind of talk about that. And they're selling because you're trying to make money off of a horse or they're Mm -hmm. selling for other reasons because you need to rehome the horse. You can't, it's not a good match or you can't take care of the horse anymore. So we're just going to go over some of the different reasons, how to go about it um, and how to take care of your horse in the process. Hmm. So anything you want to kick off with, Deb, when's the last time you sold a horse? I I was thinking about that this morning. I mean, actually sold a horse for money. I think I was in high school. Or even the last time you had to rehome a horse, even if there was no money exchanged. Um, I rehomed a horse for a boarder of mine. So that must have been 20 years ago. Yeah. So (laughs) full disclosure, you and I are on the same page in that (laughs) there are some horse owners, animal owners that when I accept them as one of my own, I'm in that category of their mind for life. Exactly. And and I kind of look at it like if I take an animal in my life, I'm going to figure out how to make it work. And yep. it's just like, to me, my horses are kind of my kids. I couldn't imagine selling them anymore, but I have in the past. And I think for all of us, wherever we land, I think every horse owner has gone through a very similar experience in the horse industry. So it's not something, even though my personal choice now is my horses are just never for sale. Right. If they're mine, they're not for sale. And it's not even a question in my mind. I go, it would be dire circumstances for me to rehome any one of my horses or my animals, my cats, whatever. So even though I'm at that point in my life, for whatever reasons, I have had to, I have tried to sell horses in the past. I've had to sell horses in the past. And that's not always a realistic situation for some horse owners that need to sell or rehome their horse. And yeah, I stay we, we, out yeah. of the buying and selling business. It's just like I, you know, it's not part of, it's not an easy part of the business for me right. because I think it's very hard on animals switching homes. Good point. <laughs> You know, I have a lot of empathy. I've seen what horses go through when they're suddenly rehomed or or sold. And yeah, I remember the look on Plumley's face when he arrived here. He was like, "What the heck?" Yeah, <laughs> I went from luxury to ranch. Yeah, <laughs> and it took him quite some time to adjust. Absolutely. And that's what we talked about on the last podcast is there's a dynamic relationship between two individuals. And if we look at our horse as an individual with thoughts and feelings, we understand a new home, a new person is kind of a big deal. And we know that whether we bought a horse and we need to think about that when we're selling a horse. Yes. Yeah. And so... There's a couple of things like the last time I considered selling a horse because I was having a difficult relationship with this horse. It just was sort of a frustrating relationship. I wasn't sure what to do. I thought I made a mistake by taking him. And I was still in the frame of mind that maybe I could find him a better situation than what I had to Ah, offer. It falls into, and I hear that all the time from owners about, Am I doing the right thing? That thought comes up or am I hurting the horse? Right. All of that comes up around that for me. And so that was my 
my train of thought the last time I went to sell a horse. And what I chose to do was I, and that's what we'll talk about today was sort of how to find a good match, the right person, Mm. if you care about where your horse is landing. Now, this podcast is not for people who are selling their horses to make a profit because that's, I, I go, okay, there are good brokers out there. There's good horse flippers or what they call pin hookers out there who <laughs> like pin hooking is just buying and selling. It, it's a thoroughbred term in the thoroughbred world. I've never heard it before, <laughs> but it's like house flipping. So yeah. sometimes you can find really, really good quality trainers who do that. And so the first thing I recommend is if you're dealing with a broker or a sales barn or a pin hooker or somebody who's working on commission is as the owner of the horse that I want to sell, do your due diligence Mm. on that person, how they do business, how fast they're turning over horses, how are they matching a new home for your horse in that process And just like real estate brokers, there are good ones and there are others that are just working for the commission and they don't really care. And I go, when it comes to a house, okay, you know, buyer beware. With the horse, you know, there's, there's this beautiful animal that's involved that has no choice. So I go Mm. as a horse owner, if I'm selling, either I'm going to find a good match for a potential buyer on my own through references, through word of mouth, getting to know the person who's interested in my horse. And I even wanted to go see the farm. Where is this horse going to be? What's your guy's philosophy? How do you train? Who do you work with? And then what I did was I gave them a three-month lease. Uh Very, very cheap. Basically, I go, you can have the horse at your place. You feed, care, pay for the vet, farrier, whatever is needed. And that was the lease, quote unquote. I didn't charge them on top of that to have the horse because I really wanted to make sure this was going to be a good match. And it takes time. It, you know, it's, it does. I wanted it any relationship. Like, I think that's great to give three months. Yeah. 90 days to sort of give the Mm -hmm. horse time to settle into the new place, see how they interact, see how the horse settles. And at the end of three months, they decided they didn't want my horse, which I was fine with. Absolutely. So I went to pick him up. And when I picked him up, he was pretty stressed. He didn't look great. And I had really vetted out these owners. I really did my due diligence. And so that was when I made the decision after I took him back and he was in a little bit worse shape than what I delivered from my perspective. I'm, it's nothing against the people. It right. could have been just a philosophy difference on horse care, horse handling, training, how the horse responded to them. I'm not blaming them at all by any stretch of the imagination. But when I got my horse back, I could see he was just more anxious Right. He didn't quite look as healthy and that could have just been stress. So it was when I took him back, I looked at him and I said, look, whatever it takes, we're going to work this out. You're my horse. And it changed my attitude about this was a horse that really was a bit frustrating to me because we weren't an easy horse rider match. Our personalities didn't really match. Our (laughs) natural tendencies didn't really match. And so I had to work at that relationship. That's a good point. I have a horse like that too. (laughs) Yeah. And once I decided you're not even for sale anymore, you and I are going to work this out. What ended up happening was a huge growth and expansion for me as a horse person, as a trainer, And in my learning, because I had to go look at things very differently for a horse that wasn't an easy match. And I I had always, my, my easiest match is a hot blooded horse. And here (laughs) he was, he was my first uh, warm blood. He wasn't even a cold blood, but he was a warm blood. And I kept thinking, because I always had hot blooded horses, I thought, oh, this warm blood will be so easy, blah, blah, blah. No, he just came with a different set of challenges than a hot blood horse. 
and I found those challenges frustrating and it was frustrating for him and me. So when I looked at selling, it was hopefully to place him in a better matched home where he would be happier, not to get rid of my problems. Do you know what I mean? And that still didn't work. I see that all the time. (laughs) And I, I think that's the biggest challenge. And I think actually saying I, I need to look at what I'm doing that's not making this work. Right. And what that's I find is people, people sort of tend to be a bit extreme in that it's all the horse's fault or it's all my fault as a person. Ah. And I go, it's really neither. It's a relationship. We, we have 50% right. input into the horse's success right? But the horse comes with their own habits, instincts, patterns, memories. It's like, so they are 50% of the equation too. So I think if, if, you know, somebody listening to this podcast is sort of in the position of thinking about or has to sell their horse, I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is why? Mm. And really look closely. Why am I selling this horse? And sometimes a bad match can be this horse is really creating so much fear that as the Uh, horse owner, I can't cope with this level of challenge. It's making me fearful. And once the human is in fear, it's very hard to make things work with the horse. That's a scary situation. Yeah. So once somebody becomes afraid of the horse, there are ways to work back from fear if you find, you know, somebody to help you with that. But some people have a level of fear that's so high, they just can't overcome it. And I go, so, okay, that's one reason. You know, my reason was pretty flimsy, is (laughs) it was just a bad match. And then I realized that decision really stressed out my horse. And that was when I made the decision, I don't sell horses anymore under any circumstances. And because I had to grow to work with this horse that wasn't an easy match for me personally, what I got out of it was one of my favorite horses I've ever owned. Like yeah, he, they're he, they're my best teachers. Yeah. He caused if I me, allow it. If I if don't I let allow my, it. If I don't let my ego and thinking that I have to get from A to B in a certain amount of time, I think those are the two big things I have to really put in check. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I don't think we always get the horse we thought we were going to get, but I find it's it like a any little, relationship. <laughs> it's a little bit cosmic. I think that I find most people get the horse they need more often than they get the horse they thought they were getting. And that was my situation with this warm blood was I really had these visions of having an easy horse that I could go compete with and didn't work out that way. And the way he challenged me was, and I think all horses do this, the sensitivity level of horses hones in on our personal challenges because they're super sensitive prey animals. So they sort of download us and they have a way at scratching at our weaknesses. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And that's what this horse did. He really scratched at my weaknesses. And when he came back to me after the lease, I just went, okay, step up to the plate, Kirsten. This is exactly, you know, I couldn't, I could not sell my problem. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing when they're going to sell a horse. If it's not because you're, you're really genuinely afraid of the horse. A lot of times the reason we're selling is because we think we're going to get rid of our problem or our challenge, and we're going to find something easier. And I find that that rarely happens. I agree. Usually the next horse you get has pretty similar issues. Or so, something else comes up, you know, it, it's, yeah. I yeah, think and, the conversation about, oh, it must be the bit, or it must be the footing. Or the saddle. <laughs> or yes. the farrier. Yeah. yeah. Or, we never look at us right, and go, what am I part of this equation? What am I contributing positive or negative to this situation? 
Well, and it's funny because a lot of times when we buy horses, we have this vision yes. of having this beautiful relationship with a horse. Riding on, on the beach and no <laughs> problems. <laughs> Winning ribbons, right. And so I think, you know, when people say to me, because a lot of times I'll ask people, what are your goals or what are you looking for with this particular horse or what did you intend? And the answer that comes back is I really just wanted this relationship with a horse. And I go, you mean relationship like with your spouse or your children kind of relationship? Mm. Because they're not always acquiescing to your desires. They're not always doing what you want them to do. Right. But a, a relationship is a back and forth. So some people think of a relationship with a horse means they never challenge you. That they're, they're just, just obedient. obedient. And they yeah. do their job and I want something push button that doesn't give me trouble. And I go, mm, any relationship is kind of dynamic. Yes. So, and, and that kind of leads me to the first bit of advice. If you're selling your horse or you have to rehome your horse, which just means a free transaction or $1, um, disclose everything. I, I don't think it serves the mm. horse in the long term to try to hide problems. And I go, there is no such thing as a problem-free horse. Exactly. So when you're buying a horse, you're looking at, can this set of problems, is it something I can manage and work with? But every horse is going to come with its own set of challenges. And so as, a, as somebody looking to rehome my horse, the first thing I'm gonna, I would recommend highly is lay it out there. Don't try to hide either the reason you're trying to sell this horse or any issues. And I go, your, your vet, your regular vet has to have permission from you, the horse owner, to disclose medical records for your horse to a potential owner. And I go, do that. Even if you have bad x-rays or past colics, I go, it doesn't mean you're not going to get the sale or that somebody won't love the horse that you're trying to sell. Mm. But you need to give people a very clear picture, honestly, authentically, to the best of your ability. Because what the horse does that scares you isn't going to scare everybody. That's what I was thinking, especially I would think people that only have our one horse owners and don't ride multiple horses so it's kind of like wearing your same shoes all the time and then trying on a new pair of shoes and going whoa this is different yeah <laughs> do I like it or do I not yeah but it, it's that adaptability those of us that ride multiple horses I think may be a little bit more available and adaptable yeah, and I like that analogy because we don't have a judgment on whether the shoe size is good or bad, <laughs> right? And we have different shoes for different purposes, right? Exactly. I go, wearing high heels in the barn, not going to work. Good idea. Not probably not a good idea. Or and wearing flops. That's not a good idea. Or flip flops. <laughs> um, and wearing my riding boots out to dinner, not a good yeah. idea. But there's, you can kind of look at it like. Even if the horse that we're selling isn't quite the right shoe size or isn't quite the right type of shoe for what we really wanted, there is a match out there. Somebody's going to love that shoe and it's going to That's a really good point because I think it took me to rehome a horse almost a year. Yeah. Till I found I, a good match. Absolutely. And one of the problems, the reason horse <clears throat> traders and sellers and all of that have such a bad reputation. And, and that's not just my opinion. I go, my liability insurance as a professional trainer, they know they have a special category for people who buy and sell horses oh, wow. in the liability insurance. So it's kind of like the only people who believe in global warming are the insurance companies, for <laughs> sure, because they see the results, right? So I find that really fascinating and so just like buying a house or buying the right shoes, you want to make sure it's a good match. 
that it fits, it's comfortable, it serves the needs. So when we're selling, if we want our horse to land gently and have a better situation than what we have to offer, we might have a price in mind, um, but the buyer may or may not be able to afford the price we have in mind. So are right. we adaptable? Can we discount the price for the right home? Are we willing to do that to help our horse land with a good match? So we have to ask ourselves that question. Um, how are we going to know about the buyer? So mm -hmm. the first thing is, as a seller, we want to be upfront. We want to be as honest about this horse so that the buyer knows what they're taking on. Because if we try to mask it or hide it or sugarcoat it, that horse is going to do what that horse does at some point. And if you don't right. disclose it, that sale might not fall through. You get your money, but that horse is going to get moved on again. Right. Because it might be a problem that was more than the buyer was willing to handle. So full disclosure is really in the best interest of the horse in finding the right match. Right. And then we need to know a little bit about the buyer. I mean, we had things in Florida that were horrendous, like people taking free horses or stealing horses or buying low cost horses for black market meat. I remember that. I just, yeah. So even those horse slaughter, I think, is still illegal in the U.S. There was a big thing about that many years ago. Um, there are black markets for horse meat. And right. so if you're selling... That's the other high recommendation. You don't rehome your horse, which means for free or for a dollar to somebody you don't know and you haven't bedded. Right. Because your horse may land in, in a meat wrapper and it's not uncommon. So, you know, seller beware that unless you know a little bit about the owner. So it's not out of like, even if the person has the money, loves the horse, you can ask for references. Mm. You can maybe ask to go visit the place where the horse is going to live. You can ask about the buyer's philosophies or who they train with or, you know, what they're looking to do with the horse. You can interview people to buy the horse. That's a good not, way to put it. And not just look at it like you're walking into Walmart to buy something. Here's the price. Out you go. Because you're never sure where your horse is going to land. So if you want to have, if you want to sell the horse, have it be a good match, have your horse be well taken care of and maybe in a better situation than what you have to offer, don't be afraid to sort of vet out whoever's interested in your horse, whether they have the money for them or not. Whether you're selling your horse for a dollar or giving to a free home, you still have the right as the seller to sort of figure out who is this person. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of checking out the barn because, you know, even I, I think of my barn, which is an old corn crib <laughs> turned into stalls. And then I, you know, there's some places here in Virginia that are very posh. That's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> and you really have to look through that you know what's the level of care even yeah. the person that's just walking them to turn them out right right I mean all that stuff matters to me because if it's an owner that's boarding the owner's probably not spending as much time with it as the staff at the facility yeah you can look at the staff you can look at the other horses in the barn you can and it's unique and personal to every buyer, every seller, what we're looking for. And as a seller, we know our horse better than the buyer at this point. So you kind of know if your horse could adapt to that situation well or not. And that's why I actually got the idea from horse rescues where I volunteered for years. They were interested in finding forever homes and they actually interviewed the adopters and needed to see where the horse was going to be located. If the horse was moved, they were supposed to notify uh -huh. the rescue. 
And if they didn't want to keep the horse, the rescue got involved in the transaction of rehoming or the rescue took the horse back. And so, and I like that by working with rescues, these are horses that have issues. And again, that's where that philosophy of disclose everything. It is what it is. If we don't give the adopter or the new home or the buyer a realistic view of that particular horse to the best of our ability, then that's when we would get um, horses coming back to the rescue. Right. And and some pretty challenging horses got adopted. There's a lot of reasons people want a horse. Your horse does not have to be perfect to find a good match. You know, and it's kind of like roller coasters. I go, mm-hmm. some people love them. They're exciting. And other people lose their lunch. Like, I go, same thing. Roller coaster doesn't change. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I yeah. go, so... Or like the shoe analogy you had, I go, it, it doesn't, you don't have a bad horse. You have a horse that has this set of challenges. Right. And so you want to find a buyer who's willing and feels comfortable and safe taking on those particular challenges. And at the horse rescues, we had big challenges I bet. that we had to disclose, but that didn't stop the adoption process. It's kind of like at all. comparing it to real estate. It's like, and I think we do this with people and with mates. It's like this energetic connection. And then the, sometimes the language somebody tells us about the house or the person or the horse doesn't matter. We've already made We've already, yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. To jump and in, you know? <laughs> it's like if you've ever had to shop for a home, you mm. go, there's, you know, this list of things I like, but there's these challenges and then there's this price. And so I, you sort of factor that all together to go yay or nay. And right? then you look at your inspection tells you what's behind the walls, anything that's not in plain view, anything you need to know about. And that's why you want to give your vet permission to disclose the horse's medical history. Yeah. Right. You it's it's that really speaks volumes to somebody looking at your horse that you are not hiding things and that um, your horse is sound or prepared or physically able to do what this buyer wants the horse to do. I think that's a really important because like we said, there is I don't think there's any perfect horse. And if you want it, like they use the term the husband horse. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> that gets used a lot, which means yeah. a horse that just doesn't give anybody any trouble, any trouble. anytime. And yeah. that kind of horse m- may not have 100% clear x-rays. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. Or it, it may can, have it pushings. It may need to be on regular medication. Right. It may and are, need... are you willing to take on that challenge? In order to have that personality. Right. Yes, Absolutely. No, and that as the seller, when I have somebody coming to look at the horse, or even if I'm helping a client, it's like, I look at how does my horse that I need to find a home for respond to that person as an individual? That's a good point. That is a heck of a good point, because I actually fired a a vet hospital because of when they came into my barn, my horses, you know, went into total... Fear, fear mode yeah and, and that I thought, tells you more that tells me everything I need to know yes and that is so dynamic so when we go beyond behavior and performance and we really look at the communication the horse is always offering us nonverbal communication with the energy level do I is my horse showing anxiety or tension or is my horse perfectly calm and relaxed um, the body language right? Mm -hmm. Is my horse getting really tense around this person? Or is my horse sort of leaning into this person with some curiosity? So it's like energy, body language, um, the expression our horse shows us, there's all this nonverbal communication, where even if everything's perfect on paper, how does that horse respond to this potential buyer? So as the seller you can observe the interactions knowing your horse 
and sort of tell my horse really doesn't like this person or my horse is pretty skeptical or my horse really responded positively to this person. Yeah, that would be the most important thing, especially in the, the horse's environment that it's in right, you know, in front of you that it's been in. How does that, how does it respond to that person when it's in its comfort zone? Exactly. Because while the horse is still in my care as the seller, my horse is in the familiar right. and should feel the safest, especially if I'm there. So then I want the buyer to interact with the horse without my influence. I'm going to take a oh, wow. step back. Wow. And I'm not going to tell this potential buyer how to handle my horse unless there's a safety issue what that if they I'm going to disclose. If they ask, I'll, I'll tell them what I know, but I'm still going to kind of observe that interaction. Okay. Right. So I'm, I'm not going to like zip my lip and go, mm, you're on your own, but <laughs> it's, I want to, I want to step out of the picture between this potential buyer and my horse as much as possible to just see and observe what's going on between these two individuals. Do I like what I see? Or is it kind of like making my guts a little uneasy? I, I know. I'd be like, <laughs> that would be so hard for me. <laughs> yeah. And Don't as the seller, <laughs> as the seller, especially if we're selling our horse for money, it's like we want to make the sale. <clears throat> so that's where when as soon as you think about selling or rehoming your horse, you got to know why you're doing it. And you want to know what is my best outcome? Do I care where my horse is going? I just want the money. Easy sale. I go easy sale. Um, but to me, that like my heart just grips it when I do that because I go, my horse who has been in my care, the horse is a hundred percent dependent on the human. They don't I get know. a choice. And right. and to me, that that's why. I can't sell horses anymore because I lose control over that horse's care. I can't stop the, the buyer from selling the horse in the future. Even if right. I offer to buy the horse back or take the horse back, they it, can, doesn't, it doesn't yeah. mean they have to. That's right. <clears throat> so if I'm really concerned about my horse's well-being as much as getting the money, it you have to do more analysis in the transaction, you know, and disclosing. And I never, even I recently had a client who wanted to rehome her horse. It wasn't working. She had a high level of fear and she goes, I'm going to offer him as a free horse because from her perspective, he was riddled with problems. And I go, he's not that riddled with problems. There's lots of people that this horse would work very well for and I said, never, ever, ever offer a horse for free out in the market. Out in the open. Out in the open. I said, if you're rehoming a horse, well, number one, the people who actually know about horses aren't going to touch a free horse because there's really no such thing as a free horse. Exactly. If somebody's not charging for the horse, that means the horse has such big problems, it could cost you a lot right? I've got one of those. So the people who actually know about horses and have good homes to offer, they rarely go to rescues to find a horse and they never take a free horse <laughs> unless, I mean, I've taken free horses, but I've looked at the problems and go, yep, those are problems I can handle. I'll take that free horse. Right. Right. So if the horse is listed out in the world as a free horse, that's going to attract absolutely the wrong people. So Good I would point. never do that. <clears throat> and I would come up with a fair price. It can be a low price, but you want that horse to be like, if it's not a free horse and it has a lot of issues, but there's some benefits, maybe it's in the $2,000 to $5,000 price category. Yeah, right. I think at location, it's very location dependent. I was having a conversation on Facebook. People were asking in a horse group how much they paid to have a farm sitter come. Mm -hmm. 
and the prices here in Virginia compared to say Idaho mm. were are very vastly different. different. Yes. No boarding prices the same. The boarding the cost of keeping a horse is vastly different in different areas. Yeah. <clears throat> the purchase price of a horse is the it's the least amount of money you're putting into a horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny that you said that because Plumley had a really rough summer and my vet bill was right way up there. Oh, yeah. And I went and was doing a trade with another Alexander teacher and she looked at me and she says, well, what's the cutoff? Yeah. And I went, oh, I don't think about it that way. No, I don't think about it that way either. But I that, think of quality of life as the well, more important and thing. That could be a reason people are selling horses is because they can't afford the medical care, which Good is point. a valid reason. But you for sure want to find a buyer who's willing to take that on. Yeah. Right? Do, you, do you want to get a credit report before? <laughs> no, not, not I go. Bad idea. <laughs> you know, people also have this outside of the horse industry perception of horse owners that we all have a ton of money. I, I go, that is so untrue. I agree. I go, some people, their whole like financial life includes this expense of owning a horse that really stretches the pocketbook, but they find a lot of value in owning a horse. So it's just what they spend their money on. But it, there's this perception that everybody who owns a horse has a lot of money. I go, I know girls who have, you know, I've lived at different farms in order to keep my horses there. That's a good point, because right? I couldn't afford it if I didn't have my horses at my house. Right. I, and I ultimately found a property where I could keep my horses at home. Yeah. And I go, that was very important to me because the cost of boarding is it, it can be out of control. Yeah. And um, and so just because somebody doesn't have a lot of money doesn't mean they're not going to make it work and that they're not going to offer that horse a really good home and very good horse care, right? But that ongoing expense, this is the reason the horse selling business has gotten so wonky is because every month that you're feeding and providing space for that horse, it can be big dollars, right? And so like in the thoroughbred industry, a lot of show horses are started under saddle very young and really pushed in order to make their money back on that horse before that monthly expense starts exceeding any possible mm -hmm. sales price, right? Because keeping a horse, they eat, eat like a horse. Or even like for breeding a horse to, you think you're, you're going to get a good deal and less money than just purchasing a horse no yeah, genetics are so <laughs> unknown the mare care the vet care i had to have uh, the mare that i bred to had twins and we had to you have to pinch one it yeah. was five thousand dollars to get that foal on the ground yeah so that's not a necessarily a cheaper way to go. No, it's not. <laughs> and not only that, but you can have awesome bloodlines, proven bloodlines of any breed, but genetics are spinning the wheel of fortune. You have no <laughs> idea what's going to land on the ground. And I leave the totally horse agree. breeding. I go to be a really good horse breeder is a skill unto its own. I go, not everybody should own a stallion and breed and own the mare. I go, horse breeders really know a lot. And they know a lot from years of study that the rest of us horse, horse owners never need to ever know about. Yeah, the, the breeder I worked with, it was countless hours of research. Oh, yeah. And they put into oh. matching stallion and mare. Yeah, and that sometimes where we can buy really good horses that aren't up to the breeder's specs because good what they point. get on the ground, they're going to sell cheaper. They recognize the confirmation, the athletic potential of those foals from day one. Yep. I can't even see that, but they see it clearly. And so even, you know, well-established breeders 
will sort of try to rehome or sell cheaply some of the babies that just they don't see the high dollar potential in. That's how I got finer things because well, she's 22 now when she was a foal, the people there at, at the auction, the Hanoverian auction could tell, which I couldn't at the time, right. that she was not going to be that 16 two hand horse. Mm. And that was back in the day. That's everybody wanted a 16 big horse, warm yeah. blood. Yeah. And she only turned out to be 15 two, which is, that doesn't matter to me. Which is um, like tiny for a warm blood. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't be popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had no clue at that time. I just thought she was cute, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes exactly that, if we buy a young horse, sometimes the reason we're selling is because the horse didn't grow big enough or because the horse, you know, something in, if we're buying a young horse, which we talked about with buying, it's like, find a good match. And it's just like your shoes. You said, you know, some of us need work boots. So it doesn't have to be fancy. We need functional work boots or hiking yeah, boots. Yeah, and like you said, when you're buying a, a young horse or a foal even, you, and you have that in your mind, what you want to do, you put years into that. Yes. Like when I wanted you to start my big mare at three and you said, no, she's, she's not, not ready. ready. So no, and I had years and money that I put in. Yes. To that. And I had one horse. Um, it was actually in training from the time he was one and a half. She just wanted me to do full handling, raise him up, get him sold as a three year old. So he was with me for a while. And by the time he was coming three, which is when he should have been getting started under saddle he still looked like he was a yearling. I mean, he just didn't grow. And she was in a hurry to get him sold. And I, of course, I ended up taking him because I I couldn't (laughs) stomach it. So he became one of my horses, (laughs) of course, at a weak moment. And (laughs) I didn't end up starting him under saddle because he physically didn't look big enough to ride until between the age of five and six. And I go, he was an odd grower, very good bloodlines, both on the mare and stallion side, was supposed to be this super high dollar, warm blood, built for athletic performance, which was part of the reason I took him. Um, But the genetics were wonky. Not a match. (laughs) Well, he just had, he had a lot of physical issues that were unknown at the time. And the first clue was, he just never grew at the same rate of other horses. He was way behind the sort of growth cycle. He still became a great horse, but it was like he needed way more years than most right. horses needed just to get started under saddle. So let's come back to selling horses. We keep talking about buying horses. So again, I think the number one tip is know your horse, disclose everything right? Know your why and be honest about why you're selling the horse and how you want that horse to land. And if you just care about getting the money, this podcast probably isn't for you anyways. (laughs) (laughs) We're not good at that. I'm not good at that. So I would say really think about the reasons, look deeply. What are the reasons I want to sell this horse, right? Because then you have options too. You can look at retiring a horse, keeping the horse. You can look at adjusting your own expectations and maybe learning from this horse, like I described with the yeah. last horse I tried to sell. What I learned by keeping him was way, it, it was a surprise and it was an amazingly great experience that I didn't see coming because of what I had to learn and who I had to become as a rider that was the greatest benefit of keeping a horse that wasn't easy for me. So sometimes changing our agenda and just accepting the horse the way it is, being willing to learn something different, right? Look outside the box. Maybe it's time to move on from the person you're working with, your trainer. 
you know, maybe, maybe, maybe just add more information, maybe start doing yeah. research, maybe start look, looking, look outside the box. Yeah. And that's what I did was I go, okay, with the level of knowledge or the type of knowledge I had currently, it's not really working between me and this horse. There so you now that I've decided to keep the horse, obviously I need to start seeking new information. Mm -hmm. And that was how I grew. Right? right. So that's one option is to really take more time before you just say, I'm selling the horse to look at it and go, if I wasn't afraid of the horse, like fear is a little bit of a different issue. If you really, if the trust is broken with that horse and you as an individual can't get past your fear, don't want to get past your fear, don't want to take it on. That's a valid reason for rehoming the horse. Right. Right. Um, if for financial reasons, you can't keep the horse, that's another really valid reason for selling the horse. I kind of look at it as selling or what I call rehoming. And rehoming means my sales price is pretty flexible. Right. And if I feel comfortable with the person and have done my due diligence, maybe I sell the horse for a dollar if my main goal is to find the right home a better yeah. situation than what I have to offer. That just means rehoming means that price is flexible. And, um, or maybe if you have a set of problems, that's really so dangerous that you can't easily find somebody to take mm -hmm. this on or a set of medical issues that is not going to turn around or it's going to be super expensive. And that's a lot to ask somebody to take on with a new horse so what that means is there may be a buyer out there or a new home out there, but it's slim pickings. Yeah, it's it narrows be, down the margin. Yes, it narrows down the potential new home a lot, a lot. So then there are retirement farms. Right. There are places that turn horses out to just live in herds as sort of semi-feral horses with food and water given. <laughs> And so there's different options, right? You know, there's different options to just putting the horse in with the first person who comes along. Good point. Yeah. And then I think if you look at it, when we say sort of matching a horse to a person, just like shoes, there's no value judgment if you're a size seven or a size nine. Right. Right. There's no real value judgment if you like high heels, sandals, or work boots. I go, sort of depends, right? But I go, somebody who's really excited, like you said, there's sort of a heart connection there. Yeah. And that horse connects to the person, and the person connects to the horse at sort of a heart level, which there is valid science for. I did a yes, podcast on the um, heart math. Yep. There actually is science behind that connection. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. If I really care about my horse landing in a better situation than what I have to offer, I kind of want to step out of that picture and see my horse interact with different humans and see, is there that heart connection between the two of them? And then I care, even if their place isn't fancy, I know that person is going to take care of that horse to the best of their ability. Right. And that also makes me pretty flexible price. Price. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. Right. <laughs> and I think too, some people who just are taking a free horse, if people are out looking for a cheap horse or a free horse and they're not experienced horse people, they got no idea the expenses that they're in they for don't. owning a horse. They don't. The purchase price is the cheapest part of the horse. Exactly. Even if you're paying six figures. It's still the cheapest part of the horse. Yep. Because the care, the vet, the vet care, the farrier care, the amount they're going to eat every month, the land they have to live on, whether you're boarding or you own it. It's like all of that is an ongoing expense. And the management, just the time. Yeah. And you know, horses don't do well as pasture ornaments. Right. You know what I mean? It's not like parking your car in the garage, and then you just go drive it once every six months. Right. Or once a month. And even if you do that, it's like, 
cars don't even work that well if they're not driven regularly. Good point. I go, as a horse owner, you probably had a diesel truck at some point. And if you don't drive that diesel engine regularly, you can't just park it and have it work for you a year later. Right. Same thing with a performance sport car. You cannot yep. park it in the garage and then take it out for a spin every six months. It will blow the engine. Right. So I go, it's that's kind of horses are like that. When they're meant to move, if they're not moving and they're sedentary, you're going to have a whole new set of problems. Yes. And again, I think we're talking about buying rather than selling. <laughs> or so, just owning. I know. Or just owning. Yes, there's nothing wrong with, and I find also even the highest level of horsemanship, my mentors were still challenged by their personal horses in the same way I was. So sometimes we feel like a failure because that horse knows more than we do, or our level of knowledge and skills hasn't caught up with the horse we have. Right. But there is no getting away from that. I have no, seen I that with so. Grand Prix riders, amazing horse, masterful horse trainers, that their personal horses challenge them, and mine do too, the same way everybody's horses challenge them. That mine do too. And that never changes. I don't think so. And it's funny because people will ask to come ride my horses because I'm a horse trainer and they have this image that I have these perfect horses. Perfect horses. <laughs> and I go, no, the horse trainer never takes the perfect horse. No. Nope. Like our heart goes to the horse that needs training. Right. So sometimes the trainer's horses are not that easy to ride. You know, they can be tricky. And I, I find a lot of horse trainers are happy to take on the tricky horses because it it's fun for us. That's why we're horse trainers. Yep. <laughs> All right, everybody. I think we better wrap it up. Um, thank you for liking, sharing, subscribing. We hope you're enjoying the Horse Geeks podcast. And if you're selling, take your time. If you yes. care about your horse, find a good match, find a good home that is within your power to do so. And you can say no, even to somebody who has the right amount of money. You can still say no and that you're going to keep looking for the right home. So yes. thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time on the next Horse Geeks podcast. Take care, everybody. Thanks.